property. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's risk management class where we are going to talk about the NARS settlement. I'm going to give you a little bit of details about the settlement. I'm going to share with you the 13 new or in some cases just reaffirming already existing practices that NAR has agreed to and will compel all of membership uh, to abide by. Uh, those practices will go into effect not later than mid-July, possibly sooner. So you're going to want to make uh, note of it. And then also, I'm going to probably reference this a couple of times during the program. Uh, this NAR settlement reminds me a little bit about COVID and how, oh my gosh, real estate's going to be upended. How are we going to do real estate with everything being shut down? Real estate will continue, but there's going to be a lot of updates and a lot of things we're going to have to move quickly on. So this is just the first of what is going to be several uh, webinars, several classes. Mike's going to help me. I think Diane will probably help us. I'm going to do some classes. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from laws and forms to uh, sales skills, negotiating, how you make presentations, because how you do real estate is going to change for some of you in a big way, and for some of you, maybe not so much. So let's get right into today's class. I'm going to share my screen and walk you through the NAR settlement. Yeah, all right, let me hit the right buttons here. There I am. Uh, everybody can see that, I hope? Yep. As I start every class with uh, how to reach me, because I want to encourage you at any time, especially now, even if it's just uh, uh, to vent a little bit or or share that you know what your stresses are with this uh, uh, new uh, settlement and some of the new things you're going to be doing. Uh, I'm always available, always happy to talk with you. So uh, during business hours, reach out to me on my direct line. That's probably the best way. Uh, um, and there's numbers on the screen there. You can also, of course, email me. That's the best email to use. Uh, my old email forwards to that. So if you have that email, it'll still work. And then evenings and weekends, I want you to know that I'm available to you. Uh, you most of you know my mantra. If you're working, I like to be available to you at the very least. So I do turn my ringer off for, for personal family reasons. Uh, uh, so my ringer is not on on the weekends, but the phone is rarely out of sight, out of even, you know, within a, a foot of my of my hand so I can see it all the time and uh, it'll light up and I'll know to get back in touch with you. So uh, text me uh, is the best way and then I'll call you back. Okay, so let's talk about the NAR settlement. Give you a little overview. You know, a lot of you have heard quite a bit about it. There is a lot of information, misinformation, let me say, on the internet, a tremendous amount. There are headlines, uh, things like NAR has agreed to slash commissions. Real estate as we know it is gone. Uh, up to 1 million realtors will no longer be in the... It is incredible, some of the... Uh, uh, headlines. So be very careful about uh, accessing the headlines. Uh, contact, you know, contact your association or myself, Mike, we'll give you the straight scoop. And if we don't have an answer for you, we'll get an answer for you. So uh, let me tell you for sure. I mean, I spent the entire weekend, I did take a little time off to go to two award ceremonies. By the way, if you haven't heard, Mike is Broker of the Year for the San Diego Association of Realtors. And so, uh, you know, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, Jeff was the end. What, a, what a, a fortunate situation. I think it was, it was quite, quite lovely to watch. Jeff did an outstanding job at that presentation. Uh, I spent, uh, with, I the spent uh, with the exception of and watching a couple of basketball games, one of them simultaneously with one of the dinners. Uh, I've spent the weekend uh, uh, reading the NAR settlement. It's 107 pages long. I've been through it three times. I've summarized it here today. I'm going to give you, you know, everything that I think matters to you 
in the settlement, and I'm going to continue to to keep the uh, posted on the developments as they unfold. And uh, not, Carr is doing quite a bit uh, uh, on the state level to incorporate some of the things we're going to talk about today in our real estate practice. So, of course, as I said, NAR and home seller plaintiffs in multiple lawsuits, not just the Switzer Burnett lawsuit, but in multiple lawsuits have reached a settlement. They've been it's been agreed to by the plaintiffs by NAR. Uh, in, in these commission lawsuits, the settlement would release from liability the named parties uh, for claims brought in various seller commission lawsuits. want to review with you the named parties very quickly. Over 1 million NAR members, which includes all of you on this call, uh, NAR itself is, is uh, released. All the state and local realtor associations are released. All of the association owned and controlled MLSs are released. And then finally, all brokerages where the owner is a NAR member and the brokerage sales volume is 2 billion or less in 2022. I almost wish we would have fit into that exemption, but uh, we don't quite get there yet. So uh, what that is, is the very, very, very large uh, independence and one franchise that I'll talk about. In fact, right here, the settlement does not include brokerages with a sales volume of over $2 billion. There are a few very large, almost statewide independent companies uh, that uh, uh, are excluded from the settlement. And Home Services of America, which uh, most of you know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, is one of the uh, divisions of Home Services of America. They are still uh, continuing to litigate the lawsuit and so they've not been excluded either. The uh, plaintiff's attorneys feel like there's probably some more money to be had from these entities, so they uh, did not include them in the settlement. NAR will pay $418 million, <coughs> excuse me, over, uh, over the next four years approximately. So they're going to make payments, which will allow them to use the funds that they collect uh, uh, and uh, over you know each year to set a portion of them aside each year to pay the settlement so it will not have a severe financial impact on NAR. Severe is a relative word. It's going to be uh, major, but NAR insists they will continue to uh, provide the level of service they always have provided, and they don't at this time anticipate dues increases other than normally expected dues increases, and they have stated none for 2024. So, uh, you know, a little, little information there. The settlement has been approved by the plaintiffs and now needs court approval, uh, and that is expected within three months. Now, presumably, the court will look to the DOJ for comment before making a decision. I can tell you that DOJ, in several lawsuits, has filed briefs with the courts when settlements were, were struck by the plaintiffs and the defendants, objecting to the settlements if it didn't meet what DOJ says are their objectives. Uh, on the internet and, and the talking heads that I respect, uh, the, 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 the opinion is divided whether DOJ was a part of this settlement. Uh, DOJ has been working pretty closely with the plaintiff attorneys, especially in Sipster Burnett. Uh, they've, they've practically been partners. So some people believe, people in the know, believe that the DOJ was a part of this settlement in, in negotiation indirectly. Others, they say, not so much. So that's what you know, remains to be seen. But I will say that this settlement gives the DOJ just about everything they wanted. So you know, presumably that DOJ uh, uh, will not file an objection to this settlement. They don't have to approve it, uh, in, you know, literally. But if they object, the the judge in the court would probably send it back for more negotiation. But it's not anticipated, so we'll see. Uh, plaintiff liars were, as I said before, was unwilling to release the very large firms or Home Service of America because they want more money, quite frankly. A uh, lot of winners and losers in this uh, lawsuit. I would say that the big winner is the plaintiff's attorneys. They're going to make millions. 
Uh, another big loser, I think, are the buyers. They're, they're, they're going to have, they're going to struggle a bit to be represented. I would say the real estate agents themselves are not losers. We're just going to have to adapt, you know, and I'm going to talk about that at the end. We, you know, some of you are going to be working a little harder, uh, you know, for a while to get used to the new system. Uh, but real estate agents, you, you guys are a great group. You're very, very resilient. You're going to adapt. You're, you're going to come out uh, this just fine. Okay, the settlement does provide guidelines on how these entities who are not included can be a part of the settlement. That that was negotiated uh, within the settlement on what uh, the plaintiff lawyers would want from the parties not in the settlement now in order for them to be included. The settlement lists 13 practice changes that realtors and MLSs will be required to follow and, of course, require their membership to follow. I'm going to review those uh, one by one in a moment. These practice changes will go into effect mid-July, possibly sooner. So on the, the ones that are a major impact to how you're doing business now, and we'll talk about that when we go through them, you're going to want to get up to speed real quickly. And that's why, as I referenced earlier, uh, REMAX Connections is committed to guiding you through this process. I want you to know, uh, Mike was on the phone with me uh, Friday morning within minutes of that uh, announcement uh, of the settlement asking me, what are we doing about it? How are we preparing? Let's make sure we are getting information out to our agent. Mike and I have talked about the classes that we need to do to help you through this. So we are going to continue to work very, very hard uh, to help you uh, get through this. So, you know, possibly sooner. That's why we're not wasting any time. I'm going to be scheduling multiple classes and asking Mike and, and uh, others who can contribute uh, to, to uh, helping you give you the information you need uh, to tune up your practice. So we're going to be ready if it happens sooner. The settlement does not cover all the lawsuits that have been filed. Litigation concerning co cooperative compensation, in other words, commissions that are filed on behalf of buyers are not included in this settlement. This is basically a settlement with uh, most all of the seller uh, plaintiffs, uh, none of the buyer plaintiffs. Okay. Now, a question a lot of people ask is, why did NAR enter into this settlement? Did they cave in? Did they did they face reality? They don't have the money to appeal? Uh, have their insurance coverage run out? I think it's far uh, more practical than that. You know, I can tell you, folks, one of my uh, functions for the for the very for the company for many, many, many years that I've been doing this is to help negotiate settlements. And settlements is not necessarily about who's right or wrong. Settlements are about what's the best outcome for the person, and in my case, the company and the agent. How do we come out as best as possible? Sometimes our client, I'm negotiating on behalf of our client. It's not a matter of right or wrong or caving in. It's let's maximize uh, the benefit, the, the benefits that are available to you. You know, uh, sometimes the best way to get what you want is make it uh, a part of the path to help the other people get what they want. So this settlement gives NAR, I think, uh, uh, some benefit. Let me let me share with you what the thoughts are. First of all, uh, if you appealed Sittler Burnett, you would only address Sittler Burnett. It wouldn't address a single other seller lawsuit. And you saw the results of Sittler Burnett. The public doesn't understand how we do business, how we are paid. And it took them, folks, they had their decision within an hour. It took them another hour to figure out administratively how to present it back to the judge. And, you know, it doesn't take long. If you've ever been in a jury, it doesn't, you know, it, you know, it doesn't take, I mean, I'm, let me rephrase that. It takes a while to organize. You got to pick a chair of a foreman. You got to, you know, get, you know, you know, get get all of the organizational side of the jury, and then you start deliberating. I don't think the deliberations on this lawsuit uh, even lasted 30 minutes. So that tells you something. And so back to this point, if we appealed Sittler Burnett, we being NAR, if NAR appealed uh, uh, Sittler Burnett, you know, they would still be subject to all these other lawsuits. So all these commission lawsuits were brought into this settlement. So that's number one. You know, and if successful, 
the Simpson Burnett appeal. It would not give us a win. It wouldn't give NARA a win. It would simply send it back and have a new trial with possibly the same verdict. So, you know, all the people who were saying, oh, we need to fight this, oh, this is wrong. Well, it's not as simple as that, see? So I think NARA did a very smart thing, if you, you know, put, you know, put that in quotes, to, to settle this, to get a, a good income. Uh, the settlement agreement covers not only Sister Burnett, but a number of Kathy Cat, Cat lawsuits. So it was a good thing to do that. Now, an important note about regarding this settlement, so you can you can be sure that you correct the misconceptions among the public when they tell you NAR made no admission of wrongdoing. NAR did not slash commissions. NAR did not say we we're a cartel and we took advantage of none of that. They make no admissions of wrongdoing. They continue to deny the assertions by the plaintiffs in these lawsuits. Uh, NAR believes that their policies uh, benefit buyers and sellers. And folks, I've been looking into this a little bit deep, more deeply on why the MLS functioned the way it did, because uh, it's not going to function the same way going forward. And it was a pretty uh, good thing, a good thing for the public and for agents and for fair housing. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. I'm going to you know, send you to a YouTube uh, video that you know gives you some insight into that. Okay. The settlement reduces liability to all the NAR members. So you know, all these Capicot lawsuits, not only do they go away, but future lawsuits uh, along these same lines would be prevented. So it was a smart thing to, to settle. All right. Practice changes. This is probably the meat and potatoes of this. Of this. And then I'm going to give you uh, some specific uh, uh, things to do, uh, best practices going forward. But in general, uh, these are the practice changes. There are 13 of them outlined in the settlement. So number one, uh, eliminate and prohibit any requirement that listing brokers or sellers must make offers of compensation to buyer brokers. So that requirement that you have to offer a commission uh, is, is gone. So it went from, you know, whatever people were offering, 2%, 2.5%, 3%, half a percent, it went down to $1, it went down to zero. It's now been eliminated. It prohibits realtors and sellers from making offers of compensation to buyer brokers in the MLS. So nowhere in the MLS will you be able to offer compensation to the buyer broker. Disclosing in the MLS uh, listing brokers compensation or total compensation is also prohibited. So what does that mean? In other words, we can't put in the MLS, you know, this is a 5% listing because uh, the presumption is that if the uh, Co-op brokers knew that a listing agent took a 5% commission. Well, clearly he intends to give us, I don't know, two or two and a half percent. Uh, so, you know, that is sort of a backdoor way of putting in the MLS, you know, a potential commission for the buyer broker. So they prohibited, the settlement rather prohibited any mention of commission in the MLS. Can't mention it in any way. You know, can't make an offer of commission to the buyer broker, a compensation. You can't list what your compensation is. Requires the MLS to eliminate all broker compensation fields, i.e. the CBB, and prohibit sharing offers of compensation to buyers in other MLS fields. Other words, confidential remarks. A couple of people have already called me and asked me, okay, they heard they can't use the CBB anymore. Uh, certainly when this goes into effect, CBB hasn't been eliminated yet, but it will be in the next you know, few months. Uh, so why don't we just put it in confidential remarks? Can't do it. Can't put it anywhere in the MLS. Number four, eliminate and prohibit any requirement that conditions membership in the MLS on offering compensation. And, and so what does that mean? You know, right now, when you join the MLS, you agreed that when you took a listing, you would offer compensation to, and put it in the MLS, that you would offer compensation to the other broker and you would pay that compensation. You also agreed as a buyer's agent, you would accept the compensation offered in the MLS. 
That was the, the commission rule that existed in the MLS. That's going away. That, that's going to be eliminated. Agree not to create, facilitate, or support any non-MLS mechanisms or databases which facilitate listing brokers and sellers from making offers of compensation to buyer brokers. So NAR cannot be involved in any databases uh, of any type to put out uh, offers of compensation to buyer brokers. Require all agents working with buyers. Now, here's a biggie to enter, enter into a written agreement, i.e. in California, the BRBC, with the buyer broker before showing any home to the buyer. So any agent who anticipates showing a home to a buyer must first have the buyer sign a buyer representation agreement. And currently the, the one that you, know, you should be using will be the BRBC. So the requirement to use a BRBC is literally months away. By the way, CAR is helping the state legislature write uh, a state code that requires any agent who works with a buyer uh, and it wants to be compensated that they have a written buyer representation agreement. So that's going to become a state law and, and that's slated to be passed uh, going into effect January 1 of uh, 2026. That might be moved up a little bit, but that was on the horizon anyway. Okay. Now, the provisions of the written agreement, and don't you know, worry too much about this because the CAR BRBC includes this, but the written agreement must disclose the source and amount of any compensation the buyer broker will receive. So our BRBC uh, has a ABCD uh, attachment provision. In other words, we have to disclose to our buyers uh, any compensation we receive from any source. That's that's uh, uh, going to be part of civil code, and that's going it, that is part of this uh, comp, uh, uh, settlement. So, uh, Car has been ahead of the curve. Car has been ahead of the curve on a lot of this. Uh, so they'd already developed a form called the ABCD, which is the Anticipated Broker Compensation Disclosure. I think I don't want to get too far on a limb here, but like I said, I, we're going to go we're going to go fast. I think in two weeks I'm going to do another class to review the BRBC and the ABCD with you, walk you through that yet one more time. There are gonna be some changes to that form, but those changes will be minor uh, and only uh, uh, make some changes relative to you know, how the MLS is uh, brought into this, uh, uh, this equation, if you will. Okay, you have to disclose the amount of compensation uh, and it must be an objectively ascertainable number. In other words, it has to be a percent or a dollar amount. It can't be something along the lines of, you know, buyer's agent will accept whatever seller pays. I mean, some agents have been writing that in, in the uh, uh, BRBCs with the absolute opposite intent, not to be vague, but to tell the buyer, look, it, don't worry, whatever I'm paid, that's what, I, what I'll accept. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, you know, whether I'm paid enough. This settlement presumes that uh, we might be trying to figure out how to get more money uh, rather than telling the buyer specifically how much money we do want to represent the buyer. So the, the amount of money on a BRBC, your compensation must be a specific percentage or dollar amount. And then finally, you cannot receive compensation from any source that exceeds the amount agreed to in the representation agreement, sort of an anti-double dipping. And again, uh, uh, Carr had addressed that, not quite this restrictively, but they addressed uh, in the BRBC, that's gonna come out by the way, uh, that you know if the BRBC specifies a, a, an amount that is less than what's being provided by the seller, the BRBC currently says, uh, what do we do with that? The default is give it to the buyer's agent. It could be checked, give it to the buyer. The give it to the buyer's agent will go away, you know, because the, the, the agreement says uh, we can't accept any money to represent a buyer uh, beyond what the buyer representation agreement states. 
prohibit agents from representing to a client that, that our services are free, basically. that We've talked about that in the past. Uh, I, the presumption, and I don't think that's a wrong presumption, uh, you know, what a buyer, what a seller pays, uh, a listing agent, what a seller pays, a buyer's agent is sort of built into the price. And so, and who pays the price? Well, the buyer pays the price. So, I mean, it might be semantics, but clearly uh, stating, you know, my services to you are free of charge. That's probably not accurate. You, you can say things like, uh, it, you know, especially if you're agreeing that your compensation will come from the seller and the seller agrees, uh, you can say things like there's no out of pocket expense to you, you know, to the buyer, but you can't say it's free to the buyer. Okay, requiring listing agents that uh, or agents acting uh, on behalf of sellers to uh, disclose to the seller and gain their approval for any payment that the listing agent offers uh, to a buyer broker. So then that's already part of the RLA now. That's the uh, lower paragraph on page one, where we disclose and get the uh, buyer's agent, I, I mean, a, a, listing, a seller, rather, we get the seller to approve how much we're going to get a buyer broker. That is why every once in a while this comes up on me. You know, this has long been a practice and, uh, uh, you know, some of us believe it's part of the civil code already. But if, an, if a listing agent is giving the buyer some money because the buyer wants repairs made and the uh, uh, seller doesn't want to pay it, once in a while, I've been asked by listing agents not to, you know, you know I don't want the seller to know because he doesn't want that. You can't do that. You can't give the buyer uh, part of the commission the seller's paying you that money without the seller uh, acknowledging it and basically approving it. So that why, that's why in the past, some of you have been told you have to do an addendum uh, signed by the seller that you're going to pay the buyer uh, for some of these repairs. You know, that's, that's where this... Uh, this is part of that, if you will. Okay. Now, the disclosure and approval must be in writing, must be executed in advance of any payment or agreement to pay the buyer's broker, and specify the amount of such payment. So this is on an agreement that any listing agent is paying the buyer broker. So because theoretically, a listing agent could say, look, you just pay me 5%. I'll take care of the buyer, buyer's agent. And that's perfectly legal but then you would have to disclose to the seller how much you're giving to the buyer's agent, be in writing in advance of agreeing to pay the buyer's agent and how much you're gonna give the buyer's agent. Require sellers to disclose to prospective sellers and buyers and listing agreements that commissions are not set by law and are fully negotiable. This is not new to any of us on this call. Okay. Prohibit agents from filtering or sorting MLS listings based on the existence or level of compensation. This struck me as odd, quite frankly. And I had to go back and reread the settlement in, in you know quite a bit more than I really wanted to, to try to figure out what am I missing? Because if you can't put compensation in the MLS, how in the world would you possibly be able to sort the listings by compensation? So I, I still haven't figured out, you know, why that's even in there, given uh, rule number or, or practice number one and number two. Uh, but anyway, it's there. NAR and MLS must repeal any laws or rules, rather, that are inconsistent with these rules. That's just a housekeeping provision. That's, that's uh, you know, nothing there to worry about. Develop educational materials that reflect and are consistent with these provisions. Uh, the plaintiff's attorneys made quite a case that uh, NAR and all kinds of NAR supported trainers were teaching and colluding agents on how to uh, get 6% commissions. Therefore, NAR was fixing the commission. They made quite a point of that. There were some embarrassing videos that they showed. The court actually ruled that they couldn't show them. They showed them anyway, believe it or not. Uh, so this settlement says NAR is not going to have any part of that. Their, their, their training is going to be consistent with these provisions. Uh, now, these practices, this is the important part now. These, well, all of it's important, but this is an interesting wrinkle. Uh, this is an exception, if you will, to some of the things we've talked about already. Nothing in these practice changes can prevent or shall prevent offers of compensation to buyers brokers off of MLSs. 
So what does that mean? That means on a broker's website, i.e. Remax Connection website, we could list the compensation we're willing to give buyer brokers for our listings. Uh, and presumably private third party websites can do the same thing as long as NAR is not involved in those websites. So in some ways, you know, we're going to simply move uh, compensation off of what is a beautiful system and a system which, you know, and I, I'm going to let you listen to this video because the video I'm going to recommend really makes a, this lady, this realtor from North Carolina, a wonderful lady, she makes a beautiful point about how the MLS made it just about impossible for agents to discriminate between each other. You know, you know, right now, you know, I have to pay, if I have a listing, I have to pay the agent who represents the buyer, no matter who they are. And I have to pay them exactly what's in the MLS, no matter what. You take that away and now, you know, you call me up and ask me, what's my compensation? I'm going to be honest. I mean, you know, what's the compensation to the buyer's agent? I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. And I'm hoping everybody will be honest. I'm not going to figure out or even think about, you know, the name of the agent and my experience with that agent in the past or, you know, any other qualifying uh, reason why I might tell them a different number. I mean, you know, think about it. Uh, that that's a uh, that I hadn't really thought about that too much until I listened to this webinar. I'm I'm gonna give you that link in a little bit. Uh, but you can do MLS. I mean, you can do offers of compensation still. You just can't do it in the MLS. And, and the MLS has strict rules on how that's governed. Are these other places going to have the same rules? I don't know. Uh, we are. I think we're not going to fiddle around with that. You you agree to offer compensation to a buyer broker. Uh, I'm going to insist that uh, that we uh, pay to whoever what we are offering and not discriminate to, you know, between you know favored buyer brokers, if you will. Okay. So you, offers of compensation are simply coming off of the MLS real soon. Things are going to be developed where we can get that information out in a rather simple way, rather than simply answering the phone and telling everybody who calls, uh, you know, how much compensation we're willing to offer a buyer broker. And then finally, nothing in these changes can prevent sellers from offering buyer concessions, i.e. for buyer closing costs, as long as the concessions are not conditioned on the re or the retention of uh, a payment to a buyer broker. So if a seller wants to offer a 2% con con concession, you know, a buyer can use it for whatever he wants. He might want to use it to pay his 2% buyer broker fee that he got to pay to the, to his broker, you know, therefore is not quote out of pocket, but that concession has to be paid whether the buyer pays an agent or not. Uh, so, you know, so, Buyer concessions can still be advertised in the MLS. And so that's going to be kind of a uh, code, I guess, uh, going forward on one way to figure out how, you know, maybe the seller would pay the buyer uh, agent compensation on behalf of the buyer. And, and our RPA already has a provision to do this now. So there are the uh, 13 uh, provisions. When I get done here, if you have some questions about them, I'll, I'll answer them. Let me kind of review with you. I uh, did some thinking about this. I'm not sure I thought of everything, but I do want to kind of list actions you got to take and the best practices you've got to start developing. So let me walk you through that here. So number one, <clears throat> first and foremost, if there's nothing else that you don't that you do, uh, at least do this: become familiar and begin to use the buyer representation agreement with your buyers. Uh, it's going to be required in a few months. So we're going to do classes, I, I think, in not, not next week, but the week after. I'm going to do another class on that. I'm hoping that CAR will have some of their changes in the form by then. But even if not, some of those changes will be kind of minor, and I'll point out to you where those changes are coming. In principle, the form's already pretty good. 
Okay. And then also the other form that you want to get familiar with, because that's going to be required, is the ABCD, the Anticipated Broker Compensation and Disclosure uh, form. These forms will be required starting mid-July, maybe sooner. The reason it could be sooner is if the judge next week, now he won't do it next week. The, the thought is it'll take him at least a couple months. But as soon as the judge approves this, these, these rules kick in. Not later than mid-July, though. All right, working with sellers. Here's some thoughts about working with sellers. First and foremost, we got to have make sure we're having a discussion with sellers that commissions to listing agents and buyers agents are negotiable. I think most of the people on this call, most of the agents in the state of California do a pretty good job because that kind of disclosure is all over the forms. So I, I, I don't think this is going to be real. Uh, anything's going to really be uh, difficult for you. Uh, you know, just make sure they understand what they pay you and what they pay uh, or are willing to pay a buyer's agent. It can be none, nothing, or it could be whatever. And it's totally negotiable up to the seller. Uh, and the seller <clears throat> might heed the listing agent's recommendations. Why would a seller maybe consider paying an agent, buyer's agent, you know, on behalf of the buyer? See, that's where you step in, might maybe, you know, explaining to a seller how real estate works, making recommendations. See, the buyer may have limited funds. Everybody I've talked to, that's the first thing they say. Well, buyers don't have enough money to pay their agent. They can barely get together the down payment and closing costs. That's a fact. Uh, so, uh, and then there are lender restrictions. You know, you can't, you know, the, you know, the VA prohibits a veteran buyer from paying a broker. See, so there's some lender instructions, so restrictions. So uh, could a seller just offer a concession outright and then the buyer can use that to pay his agent? Absolutely. So you're going to want to have conversations with your seller about that. And that's going to be part of our classes going forward. You know, like I said, Mike, Mike will do some classes. Uh, uh, Diane will, I will. Uh, any other source of, of information that we uncover to, to help you with this, uh, we're going to make that available to you. Now, also discuss with sellers how sellers can pay buyer's agents. You know, number, you know, the previous slide, why they want to. Now, how can they? Well, they can do it now through the MLS. So that doesn't change yet. For the next month or so, at a minimum, I would say probably the next two, two and a half months, the MLS and the CBB, uh, that field's still going to exist. But in the future, you know, they can do it by buyer concessions. And they can agree to pay buyer concessions. You can even put it in the listing contract if you choose. Uh, and then you can, if it's in the listing contract, uh, you can promote that on what ultimately might be our website. Our webmaster might help us make some changes as we display our listings. And there may be other third-party vendors that will help us do this. Now, working with buyers. You discuss with buyer the same thing. The commissions paid you know, to listing agents, paid to the buyer's agents, it's all negotiable. What you pay me, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, is negotiable. Isn't it interesting? We're the only industry where it's legislated. We have to tell people to negotiate the price with us. You know, when I go to Nordstrom's or I go to Brooks Brothers and I pay a pretty hefty penny for my shirts, I pay, I won't bore you, you all know, I pay a small fortune for my socks. I'm in love with my socks. They're not required to tell me, by the way, Walt, you can negotiate this price on your socks. <laughs> but in our industry, we're required by law to tell our clients that they can negotiate with us. Okay, so I, it always strikes me a little odd. Now, how do the buyer's agent get paid? You got to, you know, when you're working with buyers, you got to talk to your buyer now on how they're going to get paid, how you're going to get paid. They can pay directly by the buyer. Some of the buyers are going to come to a transaction with plenty of money. They sold the house. They got 400 grand in the bank. They need 200 grand in down payment on the house they're buying. They're going to take a vacation for another 50 grand. They can afford to pay you 25 grand on the purchase of their new home. You know, so that, that's not totally out of the question. More likely, in most cases, buy the seller as a buyer concession. Also begin using, as I said before, with your buyers now. You're going to have to develop the ability to, to uh, uh, walk a buyer through a buyer representation and broker uh, compensation agreement because in a very short while, you can't show them a house without one of these signed. So you'll want to tune in in two weeks 
uh, I walk you through that class. And then I've already talked to Mike and then, you know, I, I'll work on it. We'll, we'll get you some resources, but how do you sell it? How do you present it? How do you make a buyer presentation? I've got some pretty good material. Uh, we're going to make sure that we give you the tools you need to succeed because you're a great group of agents. You didn't cause this to happen. You didn't do anything wrong. They're changing how we do real estate. We're going to adapt. That's the key, right? All right. And the other form you're going to begin using now is the ABCD form. You're going to want to start using that and quicker the better. Now, the other thing, best practices going forward, never tell a client, especially buyers, your services are free unless you're not receiving any compensation from any source. And then finally, well, not finally, uh, do not filter or sort listings to show buyers based on the existence or level of compensation uh, offered to buyer's agents. That's known as steering. I think that will soon become impossible anyway. Now, get into the habit of talking to your co-op agent. One of the things that is sort of common among a lot of the commentators, and it's interesting because I've experienced the same thing. Agents don't talk to each other much anymore. You know, you don't call up somebody before you write an offer and discuss with them, you know, uh, you know, sellers don't call buyers, agents up and say, you know, we presented your offer. Uh, we're probably going to counter. Let me tell you what one of our concerns were. When I did real estate, there used to be a lot more of that. That may have to come back. We're going to have to start talking to our co-op agents if, for no other reason to find out, are you offering a, uh, a, a, a buyer concession? Or are you willing to pay a buyer's agent? So, uh, you know, on both sides, you know, we need to, as co-op agents, you know, call our listing agents and our listing agents need to respond. And you can do it by text. I like voice. But we're going to have to develop that. I think that's going to open, you know, I think communication is going to have to start opening up a bit. And this is not just Walt talking. I mean, almost every guru that I have any uh, uh, amount of respect for, they made the same comment in everything that I've been listening to almost, you know, nonstop from the time I get home until the time I get back to the office the next morning into the night and early in the morning, trying to get as much insight into this as possible for you. Finally, don't panic. Stay positive, adapt. You're a great group of people. You're going to get through this. Together, we'll get through this. All right, so that completes my presentation. Now I wanna open it up to questions. And I'm sure some of you have some questions. So Lindsay, do we have any in the chat? Yes, we do. So the first question is, what is the benefit of continuing with NAR membership? You know, I'm going to let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, I was going to make a comment about that. Uh, so if I repeat myself in a few minutes, I got some notes I'm going to close this with. Folks, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. NAR has been a tremendous advocate for us for many, many, many years. NAR has negotiated a settlement far better than what initially the DOJ wanted in this circumstance. Let me give you one example. In NAR, CAR, and SDAR, and uh, uh, NSDCR, they're, they're all linked, right? You join one, you join them all. Many states shut down real estate during COVID. Now, NAR worked instrumental in getting a na nationally getting real estate open back up again. CAR did it from the get go. You know, you could continue to show houses during COVID. You could continue to meet with clients during COVID. You know, a lot of places couldn't do that. A lot of businesses were shut down. CAR was very instrumental. Now, okay, the rules with COVID, okay, but you got to do A, B, C, D, and you got to have a written this. Or written. We, you don't have, you know, Walt doesn't have time, much less the legal experience to write up these forms, all those forms from COVID. Those weren't created because CAR didn't have anything better to do. They were com com created because the state mandated, if you're going to do real estate, you have to do X, Y, Z. So they put a form together. If you're going to do an open house, you got to post a sign and you got, 
car made the sign for you because you would have to research because there were things that had to be on that sign. And so those of you that went through COVID, you know, I was on, and I, you know, I, I told Mike earlier today, this kind of reminds me of COVID. We're going to be very busy for the next two or three months, you know, helping agents adapt to the new environment. COVID was a new environment. So CAR got you through that, whether you know it or not. You know, you would have been shut down. You would have been breaking the law and possibly sued. Uh, you know, somebody gets sick and you didn't follow the new regulations because you didn't know what they were. And by the way, they weren't tweaked so that you could do real estate. You know, so yeah, so, you know, they're not perfect. You no, know, let me... Let me close. Uh, let me give you my close now because I just want to make this make this point. You know, by you know, you can be mad at NAR. You know, NAR was prohibited from putting on a defense by that judge. Everybody who knows anything about law thought that NAR should appeal uh, because that judge did not follow antitrust court case guidelines. We could not defend that commissions were in fact negotiable. We couldn't even defend that, you know, which is central to our defense. The judge wouldn't allow it. We had grounds to appeal, but I, as I said earlier, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to appeal because they just have another, do another court case and it would come out the same and we'd have all these other court cases. NAR would be in court nonstop with all these cases. So, you know, settle and get on with life. Did NAR make some mistakes? Could they have done better? Of course. But are they valuable? You know, your independent contractor status is a result of NAR. Now, if you would just as soon be an employee with an hourly wage, I don't know who you work for because I don't think Mike's hiring anybody. Uh, you know, we got staff. We're pretty full on staff. So, you know, uh, NAR made it possible because that was under attack. It's under attack now. And again, NAR and CAR have been meeting with the DOD, the department, DOL, to get assurance that you can continue to be an independent contractor. You know, as I said, they're not perfect. You know, REMAX connections are not perfect. We make mistakes, you know. But every day, Mike, Jeff, Holly, Stephanie, Emily, Lindsay, and now Diane work their butt off to give you the kind of support you have a right to ask for. We're here to help you. And, and even if we're not perfect, you know, I would say we're better than not having anybody here. Imagine calling up Lindsay and the phone just rings and rings and rings because she's not there anymore because you decided not to be a member of whatever it would be that you'd have to be a member to be able to reach Lindsay or reach Diane or reach Jeff or reach Mike or reach me. So I may sound like I'm preaching, but I am passionate about the fact do not bail on your membership. This is a professional organization that represents over a million small independent contractors. Your voice would be a whisper in the wind without NAR. NAR is the largest, strongest lobby in Washington, D.C. Carr lobbies the state legislature every single day. Uh, yeah, okay, that's answered my question there. Okay, <laughs> get off my soapbox. <laughs> How are listing agents supposed to disclose to buyer's agents a commission compensation? Well, right now it's still in the MLS, obviously. Uh, going, you know, you can, you can, you know, as I said before, change the verbiage a little bit. You can offer a buyer concession and, you know, most agents are going to figure out real soon that that can be used, you know, by the buyer to pay the buyer's agent. So you can use a buyer concession. Uh, and you can also answer the phone when agents who are being taught everywhere, I hope, uh, will start calling you and saying, are you offering a compensation? You know, it, it, which is kind of crazy, right? What the DOJ, who drove this, by the way, and what these lawsuits did would just make our life a little more complicated, but they could not prohibit us from offering compensation, but they did take it out of the MLS. Hope that answers your question. 
you'll get more guidance there. And I do think we're going to tweak our website in some way, you know, where our listings can be observed and our compensation that we're offering can be posted there. Why use the MLS if Zillow, Trulia, and Realtor.com have the ability to disclose commission and compensation to a buyer broker? Uh, well, they no. Well, we don't know that they're going to be able to do that because now they do it because they pick it up as part of the feed. See, so we're not even sure. By the way, Zillow stock is, is way down. Uh, some of these, uh, until these people adopt to these uh, new changes, we're not sure how and what they're going to do. Uh, I, I can tell you, know, but let me start with the first part because why use the MLS? That's what's a little frightening. The MLS is a beautiful database. So, you know, if we, and the MLS has a certain amount of clout, you know, by having rules be followed. And interestingly enough, MLS is recognized in civil code. You know, if you put something as a listing agent in the MLS, that's in the civil code. What's not in the civil code is if you put something in Zill in a Truly or 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 uh, Zillow or something like that. That's not in the civil code. You put something on the internet. That's not in civil code. So uh, I would uh, you know don't bail on the MLS either. I think the MLS is very important to the function, and that is still where all these uh, uh, other websites are going to pick up your property. Uh, you know, they just won't pick up a uh, commission field. I hope that answers the question. What if, what if a buyer calls on a listing of mine and wants to see it? I always ask if they have an agent. Most times they say no, whether it's true or not. Right. Will I now have to have them sign a BRBC prior to showing? You won't have to do it today. You won't have to do it next week. You will have to do it by July. So you're going to want to tune in, you know, over the next many weeks as we develop classes and how do you introduce that to a buyer? You know, I don't want any of you to stress out, you know, you got a buyer calling you tomorrow. Oh my gosh, now I got to have him sign a BRBC. What do I do? I don't know what to say. No, no, go ahead and meet with them, show them the house uh, tomorrow. Maybe even next week, maybe next month, but pay attention, pay attention to what we send out to you uh, as we get closer and closer to that requirement. We're going to guide you on, you know, not only the law, not only the forms, but the sales side. You know, you're very fortunate. You have, you know, and I, I mean this sincerely, you have an excellent salesman as a broker. He has built two major real estate uh, businesses before he became the broker of Remax Connection, one in Michigan and one in here in in, in uh, San Diego. My point being, the guy knows how to work with buyers and sellers. You know, he, he's going to give you some good guidance. There's going to be guidance available. Here. I'm going to give you some guidance. I've got a pretty strong, most of you know that. I've got, you know, as strong as just about anybody, background in sales training. I've been a national speaker uh, for you know, one of the premier sales training companies in the country. I got more stuff. I mean, Mike made me digitalize some of it. Uh, I still have a lot of in boxes, <laughs> in storage, and a lot on my shelf. We got a lot of material that we're going to be able to help you with going forward. But you are going to have to be able to say to a buyer, love to show you the house. When can we get together so I can present to you, you know, it's not dialogue, yet that's attitude, uh, a buyer representation agreement. But well, right now, go ahead and show how. If you're the listing agent and you have an open house and somebody comes in and looks at it and, and says, I want you to write an offer, along with the offer, you have to put the BRBC, correct? Well, along with writing the offer, they have to have, have, to have, yeah, the have to write a BRBC as well, right? And here's, let me back that up a little bit more, Liv, because this question's already been asked and cars looking into how we do this. Somebody walks into your open house you can't yeah. let them pass the front door with these rules in effect. They're not in effect yet. Don't panic yet. I've just given you a heads up. Here's what's coming. We're going to help you. But after July, when somebody walks into that open house, you can't let them go to the kitchen, down the hall, upstairs, until they sign a BRBC. So, th so that's why you want to pay attention. That's why I told you a lot of changes are happening and, and, and management, the staff, 
We are rallying to talk to Mike about this already. As I said, Mike's talked to me already. Mike is leading this. He's he's made it clear to me. I mean, we're on the same page. We think a lot alike on many things. Uh, we need to make sure our agents are taken care of. We've got to get information out there. So we'll help you. But yeah, Libby, after July, you can't even let anybody go through your open house without a BRBC. Unless they're with an agent. See, now they're with an agent. <laughs> They've already signed the BRBC with that agent. You don't need one. If they don't have an agent, they got to sign one with you. Did Did you say that um, buyers can't, VA buyers can't pay their agents? The VA regulation right now says that a buyer cannot pay uh, a real estate agent compensation. I don't want to get out on a limb here, but I, I talked one lender out of that. I don't know how I did it. Uh, but I did. <laughs> I got, that was once, uh, you know, I, I don't get asked to do that too often. Those regulations, I think, will change. The concern many of us have is how long will it take? Uh, will REMAX create buyer broker agreements for different time periods of working with the buyers? For example, single time and payment for that versus months or year of working with the buyer? Well, I don't think we'll create one because I think the car form already addresses that. You just may not be familiar, but the, the car form can specify a single house. The car form can specify a single day. In fact, even with the old form, when I used to teach it, one way to get a buyer to sign one is to have them sign one for one day. A buyer will sign one for one day. Say, now, before we go out, I want to be sure, blah, 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 blah. I won't give you all the dialogue, take up the time. After you've shown them five houses and they like you and you want to work with them, you say, would you like me to do some more work for you? Yeah, okay, well, let's extend this agreement. That's easy. I've taught that for years. That's a very, e one very easy way to get a buyer broker representation signed is start with one day, show them houses all day. If they hate you, they, they're not going to work with you anyway. They love you. They're now going to sign an extension which is simply a one-page document. Is REMAX Connections going to continue to require we all continue paying in our uh, NAR membership? For now, yes. If we already have signed listing agreements that extend past July, do they need to be changed? Uh, that's being looked into. Uh, there, may, Yeah, there may be a addendum to the listing agreement. Car is working on that now. That is, that's a great question, by the way. I don't know who's asking all these questions. They've all been very, very good questions. But yeah, you, you know, Car Legal is very, very, the Forms Committee, very, very aware that we have to, you know, provide a transition uh, for existing listings. Should we require a proof of funds from buyers who submit offers now to include all close, closing costs? plus their buyer's agent commissions now so that the buyer isn't short on funds at closing? Well, I, you know, again, that's kind of a more complicated question than a simple yes, no answer. If, if, if the buyer uh, is willing to pay you outright, well, then you'd probably want proof of funds to have that much money because that would be a closing cost. But a buyer could very easily say, oh, I don't have enough money to pay you. And you can say, well, that's all right. We can ask the seller to pay it. And then when you put that in the offer, right, and the seller doesn't agree to pay it, then the buyer can buy a different house. The buyer's not stuck because, you know, the buyer only pays you when the house they buy closes. So, I, you know, the simple answer is not, oh, yeah, they have to have enough money to pay you too, because they could very likely simply take the approach, no, I'm only going to buy a house where the uh, seller is willing to uh you know, pay that closing cost for me. So then they don't need it in their funds. Will, Remax, that will Remax Connections have a minimum amount of commission we have to charge a buyer or a seller? Probably not. And there's a reason for that. I think, call me up and I'll lecture you on a minimum commission. I can promise you. You think I'm on a soapbox now? Let me get on that soapbox. I won't hear. But that may conflict with independent contractor law. So, so I, you know, I, I can tell you, Mike and I both think, yes, yes, there should be a minimum. Uh, however, you know what we can do? I just don't want to open up a can of worms. 
we can have a minimum fee you got to pay the company. That is legal. <laughs> so you might want to get enough commission to cover that. <laughs> Some of you uh, have tried to give away your services and I've had to tell you, well, wait a minute, you got to cover the transaction fee. I got to insure this transaction. Come on. So. How do you know or stop buyers from signing BRBCs with one, more than one agent? Finding out what each wants and picks the ones with least request of commission. Well, that's an interesting, uh, that's going to be an interesting lemon you need to work for. Recognize the fact that the default on the BRBC is a non-exclusive. So they can, in fact, sign multiple ones. And then they only owe an agent who is, you know, an agent for an involved property. And so I'll go through that again. For some of you who've been through my previous classes, I've talked about that at some length. Uh, but the default is, uh, you know, buyer can sign, you know, 10 of them. Go out and look at houses and see 10 houses and sign 10 different ones. As long as they're all non-exclusive, the buyer hasn't taken any, any chances. When the buyer signs an exclusive one, uh, the buyer's got a problem. We would have a problem if we don't explore that a little bit with the buyer. So I don't want to get in the weeds too much. But believe me, that you know we're very aware of that. And I'll talk to you about that and how you do that in the dialogue you need to use to prevent the buyer from inadvertently obligating themselves to pay two brokers because they uh, they signed two exclusive contracts. If seller's concessions are not listed on the MLS, what recourse do we have as far as proof that the listing agent verbally, what the listing agent verbally said they are? That's a great question too, because even if it's listed in the MLS, uh, the MLS is not part of the contract, right? So there's already been talk. Again, this is why you don't bail on membership. You want to hire an attorney to write these forms? You know, no. Car does this for you. Plus, they ensure that if the form goofed up, you're covered. All right. So Car is working on a form. Probably that'll probably be necessary, and that is a memorialization between brokers. Yes, I've said to you that. Uh, well, first of all, the buyer concession will be in the contract. But if the agent's paying the money out of their commission, I guess I got off track a little bit with your question. Go back to your question. So if it's in the MLS, then you put it in the contract and the, and the seller signs it, then that's how it's memorialized. The seller agrees because you already have a buyer representation agreement with the buyer and the seller's agreed to pay that closing cost on behalf of the buyer. What, where I went to wasn't part of your question, but it might've been. And that is if the agent says, yeah, I'll pay you, uh, and it's not a buyer concession, but the agent said, oh, yeah, I've got enough commission I can pay you. How do we memorialize that? Because that is another solution that agents continue to take 6% listings or 5% listings and then just not in the MLS, but on their website. They, out of my 5% commission, I'll give you two and a half. See, and again, that's why you can't put 5% in the MLS because DOJ has already figured out that's what agents will think. Oh, you got a five. That means I can get two and a half. But you can say that on a private website. See, but but since it's not in the MLS, what contractual obligation does exist for the listing agent to pay that? So a form is going to be developed for that. I hope I hadn't confused you. I answered uh, the question you didn't ask uh, as, as a part of the question you did ask. Can the agents have a written list of the 13 points? Yes. I'm going to give you these notes. You know, I, I got it. I didn't, I didn't do this at the beginning. I, I owe this to Lindsay and Emily folks. They are saints when it comes to helping me every day, by the way, but especially as I get close to doing risk reduction. So all of these things you see on screen, Lindsay types all of it. All I do is cut and paste it onto a, a slide. So Lindsay has typed up Bless, bless her heart, this entire presentation. Uh, and we'll we'll put that in a PDF. It's a, it's a, on a, 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 a Google sheet that she shares with me so that I can cut and paste them onto slides. So I'm going to, you know, print that out and then PDF it. And I will do that uh, not later than this time tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll send this out, the entire presentation with all of the things you saw on the slides. Um, part of this question has been answered, but will REMAX require a minimum commission when the listing agent ends up doing both sides? Will our deductible remain the same when we end up with dual agency? 
Yeah, yeah. no, our, our deductible, well, our, interesting, our deductible, uh, that is a good question. Our deductible on dual agent, I need to confirm. Right now, I believe our deductible is based on claim. So if if dual agency and the buyer sues us because he thinks we didn't do a good job, our deductible kicks in. If the seller then counter sues us because the buyer is also uh, suing us, it could be that that's a separate lawsuit and there'd be a new deductible. But then on the other hand, I'm answering my own question here. No, I think what would happen is we would move to conjoin the two lawsuits so they become one lawsuit and then we'd have one deductible. So I think the simple answer is no, you're gonna have one deductible per, per transaction. But I don't wanna say that because you could have a law, you could have a buyer sue you uh, and then uh, somebody else in the transaction sue you. That would be a different lawsuit. So it's based on the lawsuit. Probably confused the heck out of you. <laughs> what should listing brokers advise their clients about the prohibition of offers of compensation on an MLS? You should tell your client, and again, I'll give you language for that. That's going to come in, 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 in a few weeks. But you should tell your client that uh, right now, the law does not allow us to offer compensation in the MLS, it's it's uh, it's been uh, ruled a, a non-allowable field. I'll give you some good dialogue for that. Right now, you don't need to worry too much about it because that's not going to change for several weeks, maybe a month or two. But then it will. Will agents be apprehensive about working with buyers and showing them dozens of homes over the months, and with the chance of not being compensated? Well, that's why you have a buyer broker agreement. I would argue just the opposite. In one way, here's the problem I've always been told. One way or the other, when I and I've been preaching getting a buyer broker agreement, buyer representation agreement from the beginning. But I've always been told one of the reasons agents resist is no other buyer agent makes the buyer sign a representation agreement. So I'm simply going to drive that buyer to another agent who I don't need an agreement. Oh, good. I'll work with you. That goes away with this. But every buyer's agent will be required to require their client to sign a buyer representation agreement. I would say, and that's part of the benefit. I mean, I'm preaching, you know, benefit to being here at the company, uh, but that's part of the benefit of you being here because we are going to be leading in that field. We're going to teach you uh, how to make presentations, how to get the buyers to sign these agreements because you can't work with them without. And there are going to be some agents that won't, won't get that training. And they're going to be slow to, to this learning curve. They'll get it eventually because they'll starve if they don't. Uh, but they'll figure it out. But you're going to be ahead of the curve. We're going to make sure you know how to navigate this as quickly as we can put it together for you. Because when these presentations, when these agreements rather are required, we want to make sure you have the skills to make a presentation just as good as some of your listing presentations are. And some of you do very well with those. We're gonna make your buyer presentation strengths just as good. Is a BRBC required for each property shown? No, it's a client, uh, uh, it's a client based uh, document. If we advertise the buyer compensation on our website, can we mention in the agent only remarks on the MLS for agents to look at our website for that information? Say that again. That was me. So if you advertise the buyer compensation on an agent's website, yeah. in the um, agent only remarks on the MLS, can you say, check my website for compensation? I wouldn't say check my website for compensation. I'll find that out. That's a good question, by the way. But I don't think you're allowed. You'd be allowed to do that. You know, they're going to want no compensation mentioned in the MLS. Period. And again, buyer concession. Get that word. That's the word. It's not. You know. The, you know. The, what you're going to put in the MLS and the confidential remarks, and I think there may be a field for that eventually. Buyer concession. Yes. How much dollar amount? I think that'll be there. Uh, but for now, it can be in confidential remarks, but it cannot reference commission. So with that, I think it's the same sort of thing with if you rep if you reference a website relative to commission, I think that's going to be ruled. Nope, can't do it. The word commission and compensation 
going to go away in, in the MLS. Um, Brenda made a comment that she mentioned to a Stephanie about putting together a social media post that you could share with your clients and prospects in your sphere mm -hmm. um, to get the best points of this lawsuit across because there's so much misinformation everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, Stephanie just mentioned she's going to get together with you to put some points into a post um, so that we can share that with our agents. I love that. Brenda, thank you for thinking of that. Stephanie, thank you for 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 having the ability to do this and the, the skill level yeah you and i'll get together let's do that let's put some things together get, get the word out because that's part of what we should be doing is educating our public about what this nar settlement really is all about I is like new con it <laughs> thanks stephanie is new construction going to be regulated as well uh well what's being regulated yeah, that's a good question can a buyer tour a new house with an agent who's an employee of the contractor? That's a good question. I'll look into that a little bit. I suspect not. I do. They will not be able to advertise commissions in the uh, MLS. Now, could they advertise a referral fee? I, that could be, that's questionable. Is the buyer prohibited from working with another agent after signing a BRBC? Not necessarily. As I said, the BRBC's default is non-exclusive. And so an agent's right to a compensation under a BRBC is conditioned upon the agent being involved in the property. And the BRBC defines what involved means. It also says what's not involved. Sending a buyer a list of properties that are on the market is not involvement. So that doesn't protect your commission. Meeting with the buyer to go down that list, whether it be on a phone, Zoom, or in an office, does categorize you as an involved agent on that property. So, uh, so the answer to your question is, yeah, a buyer could sign as many BRBCs as they want to, as long as they're all non-exclusive. And then an agent is protected uh, on the BRBC that the buyer signed with that particular agent, if that particular agent is involved in the property that the buyer purchased. And involved is far more than just writing the offer. Again, CAR helped you. CAR made a document that really says, if you really are working with this buyer, not just sending them a list, but working with them, calling them, answering questions, doing some research on a property under the BRBC, you're entitled to a compensation no matter what happens. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. And I hope, you know, the side point was one more plug for your association. Folks, your associations are valuable, you know, even when they goof up. You know, my wife sometimes really upsets me. I don't know about you. I don't want to be too personal. I think I upset her. There's a song, and one of the favorite lines in that song is, I know I do annoy you. And I, I played that for my wife, and she said, there you go. That's right. I'm not throwing my wife out because <laughs> she's really ticked me off over something. Uh, so don't, don't do the same thing to the association. They're there for you through the thick and thin of it. Are there any exclusive right buyer broker agreements or can you write that in anywhere? The exclusive right is a box you can check on the buyer broker agreement. Great question. The default is non-exclusive, but then a box is, nope, this is exclusive. You buy any house, you pay me. Can an agent get compensation from both the buyer and the seller? Like if one can pay 1%, can you ask the other to pay one and a half percent? As long as it doesn't exceed the total amount on the BRBC. So if you do a BRBC with the buyer for 1%, you can't then get one and a half from the seller. You cannot get more than 1%. So the way to do that is to do a BRBC for two and a half. And then all you have to do is ask the seller to pay you one and a half on behalf of the buyer and the buyer will pay you the other one. Hmm. Hope that was clear to everybody. Lindsay's nodding her head, so yeah. it's clear to her, but she's pretty smart. <laughs> She, she knows me. She can follow me better than most people can. <laughs> um, seller commission comes out of seller's equity. It's going to be much easier to enforce our ability to get paid when the seller is paying. Can buyers, agents get paid up front or have no. a retainer? It's against the law to collect a commission in advance. 
Can we carry a note for commission if needed? I did it a few times in the past. Uh, yeah, I suppose you could. I mean, you talk to me. I'm not going to give you a blanket approval, but I'm going to say on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. you know, if it makes sense and and we're not hurt by it, you and the company and and for, and for that matter, the client, maybe I should put the client first. Uh, yeah, that, that's a possibility. If the seller agrees to pay the buyer's commission, how can the listing agent, I don't know what this means, but how can the listing agent shell handle if buyer agent's already receiving compensation from the buyer? Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, in other words, how does the listing agent not get in trouble for inadvertently paying the buyer's agent too much? If that's the question, that's a good question, by the way. I suspect you would not be liable. The buyer's agent would be liable for collecting too much. So if you have a BRBC, you still put that in an offer to see I seller will pay. Oh, that's what it says. I don't know. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, first of all, you don't provide, you don't have to provide the BRBC in its entirety. You do have to document that you have a BRBC if you check paragraph 3G3 on the RPA, asking the seller to pay the buyer's obligation under a BRBC. So you do have to document that. So I don't know if that, we're not sure what that question is, right? <laughs> No, I don't know. It was Azeem's question. Azeem, do you want to chime in? Well, we'll just move on. Since the settlement does not cover BHHS. No, that that, that, that oh. wasn't my question. My question was, if the seller offering compensation to the buyer agent and the buyer agent is already getting compensation from the buyer, how the listing agent should handle this uh, situation? Well, I guess I think that'd be on a case by case basis, depending on the listing agent's knowledge uh, and whether or not it, you know, from my perspective, putting my legal hat on, could we somehow be in, implicate, implicated in colluding to get the buyer agent more money? So I'd be looking for that. So on a case by case basis, we'd, we'd look at that. But in general, if your fear is you have no clue, the seller said, I'll give a 2% uh, uh, concession. Uh, or, 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 you know, pay a buyer commission. You can't put that in the MLS, but if the seller said, yeah, I'll pay the buyer broker commission and it's more than what the buyer broker agreement is, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure you as a listing it will be held responsible. It's, it, you know, maybe we need to look into how that gets done. Maybe we need to document before we pay it that the buyer uh, agent is entitled to it. So uh, hey, well, in general... Hey, well, can we ask the uh, buyer agent when they are up, uh, putting offer to ask them if they are getting compensation from the buyer? Can you ask the buyers uh, if they're getting compensation from the buyer? Yes. Uh, I don't know that you can ask that. That's a good question too, but uh, I, I can, I'll look into that. Can you because ask? You know, you know, for example, if I am dealing with my seller, I would encourage the seller to offer some compensation to the buyer broker because that way he has better chance to sell for a higher price and then also sell quicker. But at the other side, you don't know if the buyer uh, broker is already uh, or buyer's uh, agent already getting uh, two or three percent from the buyer. So, so you don't want a, a buyer agent a oh, double okay. dip. Right. And again, I I don't get in the weeds here too much this early, but I, as a practical matter, that's all got to be paid through escrow. And I suspect escrow is going to be looking. Escrow doesn't pay a listing agent without the seller signing for it, uh, with the buyer signing for it. And uh, it's going to be the same with the buyer brokers. And they may want to see, just like they want to see listing contracts, you know, to see that commission amount, they may want to see buyer broker uh, contracts. Uh, so there may be mechanisms to prevent agents from circumventing this. Uh, but in general, if the listing agent is acting in good faith and the buyer's agent somehow tricks uh, whoever that they end up with more money, I see it hard 
for the listing agent to be liable for that. Now, my concern is, you know, if the seller find out that the buyer agent getting already paid by the buyer, and then he's also paying the buyer agent too, they may have an issue with the seller unless a seller in the counter offer rights, you know, if the buyer agent is getting a compensation, then, you know, seller is not obligated to pay, you know, something to cover ourselves. But, because we don't have a... Azim, you're, you're getting into the weeds here. There's already language to that effect in, in, in the documents already. Okay. Well, we have to move on because there's a lot yeah. of questions still. Yeah. Okay, uh, since the settlement does not cover BHHS or large companies like EXP, what are they obligated to do and or how are they expected to comply or change? Well, they're going to have to comply to these rules as NAR members. So these changes will, uh, well, no, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. The, the membership is compelled. Are the brokers compelled? I don't know. Uh, I'm. They're going to have to continue to litigate this if they, in fact, don't get included. Now, EXP is not uh, is not included in the settlement because uh, if if it's if if the individual brokerage, if EXP, I don't know how EXP is structured, but if they have uh, do business under one broker's license, they clearly exceed two billion. They then do. they're excluded, and then they need to negotiate, become a part of the settlement. NAR tried to get everybody in, including Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and, and these other entities were willing to be included, but uh, uh, these uh, plaintiff lawyers did not want them included because they believe there's more money to be gotten. I mean, they got stuff, they got money from Remax, they got money from... Uh, you know, all of the other big franchises, they want money from Berkshire. They want money from XP. So they, I suspect they will end up getting included. Can you explain how transaction coordinators will get compensated? I don't think that changes. Are the listing contracts staying the same or are they going to be changed? They're going to be changed a little bit because right now they talk about compensation placed in the MLS. You know, so the language of both the BRBC and the RLA needs to be cleaned up. Uh, but in principle, uh, they, they already cover most of this. You know, the, B, the the lifting contract already talks about paying a buyer broker, you know, authorizing you to pay a buyer broker a percentage of my commission. It's just got to clean up, not through the MLS, not, you know, that kind of thing. Will a buyer be able to be unrepresented if they refuse to sign a a, briar, a broker compensation and are refused to pay out of pocket broker fees? Yeah, yeah, they can, they can, you know, that's one of the big complaints uh, you know, about this settlement that you know, DOJ inadvertently screwed over a lot of buyers because they're going to go unrepresented. And the DOJ, uh, I mean, not the DOJ, a lot of uh, talking heads. Uh, take it a little further. I don't. I don't want to be on record. I guess I shouldn't say this because it's being recorded. But uh, dual agency. They. They. They don't like the idea that buyers are going to be, be becoming dual agent. Uh, you know, in, getting involved in dual agency with listing agents, so they don't have to pay a uh, commission and they won't be well represented. Well, they better be well represented if they're a dual agent. They will be represent well represented in Remax Connections because I'll make sure everybody understands what the rules are for dual agency. But the fear is buyers are not going to be well represented who do not want to get, don't want to pay and they can't get a seller to pay on their behalf. That is a problem. If we have an exclusive BRBC and the buyer buys the home with the listing agent, will Remax Connections legally enforce the BRBC? We will protect your rights under a BRBC to the extent it's possible. I see a lot of confusion for buyers when they sign the BRBC, not knowing whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive, as this has the potential of buyers being taken advantage of by agents. Of course, not a REMAX agent. That was a comment made by <laughs> Vicky. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Um, let's see, does the listing agent need to see the BRBC along with the RPA? Not necessarily. They, there is a provision in the RPA that the uh, buyer's agent has to document that they do, in fact, 
that the buyer does in fact have an obligation to pay a buyer agent commission. So they do have to document that. Some have said page one of the agreement's enough. Uh, you don't necessarily have to present that at the beginning, you know, but you would perhaps in the escrow provide a copy of that. Uh, why would a buyer want to pay commission to the buyer broker when the buyer would pay zero dollars going direct to the listing agent? Well, that's going to be part. I mean, I could go on and on. You don't want me to now in the interest of time, but that's going to be exactly what we're going to help you with. You know, I mean, let me throw the question right back at the person who asked that question. Why would a seller pay a listing agent a commission when they can put a for sale sign in their front yard? See, well, the answer to that question is, you know, come to the seminar, you know, come to part one, part two, and part three of the seminar. We'll teach you how to sell your value. Well, we're going to have to do the same thing with buyer agents. I mean, buyers. We're going to have to be able to show it. By the way, I don't doubt for a minute. Mike doesn't doubt for a minute. No, nobody on this call, I hope, doubts for a minute that buyer's agents don't bring tremendous value to a transaction. The, the, the thing that's changed is buyer's agents have never had to sell that to buyers. The MLS protected, if you will, I don't like, maybe that's not the right word, has enabled, that's the better word, enabled buyer's agents to do a very good job, by the way, but not having to sell that up front. You know, the fact that you never sold a buyer to sign a buyer broker agreement didn't mean you didn't do a fantastic job. You did. I work with you every day. Some of you guys, the time and effort you put in, phenomenal. You've just never had to sell that up front. Now you are. There's a couple of people on this call who I personally invited to this call for sure, because I know how hard you work for your buyers. And you're going to want to know about this because you're going to have to develop skills because of these rules. I wanted you to know the rules so that you are now invested in coming to these future classes we're going to do to teach you how to make buyer presentations. Should we prepare our sellers with information that they may be asked by the buyer agent to pay a buyer concession of, a, of an approximate amount to help prepare the seller's bottom line? Yeah, I would. I'm not sure. Sure, I understand the point of the question other than, well, yeah, you want to prepare the, you know, as I said in my, you know, best practices going forward, you know, toward the end of the, of the program there, uh, you're going to want to discuss with a seller uh, that they may well want to offer compensation, uh, uh, you know, concessions rather, to the, uh, to the uh, buyer to cover some of these costs that a buyer is going to incur as a result of uh, being represented by an agent. And we're going to want them to be represented by an agent. I mean, that's just part, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but that's just part of what how we sell sellers and buyers. You're going to want representation so that we minimize lawsuits, you know, so we don't have problems afterwards. Um, Jamie Mellum's wondering if you'll please confirm our liabilities and E&O coverage as dual agents, as we previously discussed, and email that answer out to us. Well, let me, let me I, I, I might have confused you. You are absolutely covered by dual agency. Absolutely. Mike, one question is, if multiple lawsuits are filed, is it one deductible or not? But then I answered my own question because I know what the common practice would be. And we've done it before. Not not Mike, but I, you know, many of you know I've been doing what I do for Mike, you know, for a long time <laughs> for some other owners. And we've had in the past have to combine lawsuits, you know, get sued by two entities for the same transaction and basically the same problem. So we combine them in one. And so that becomes one claim. Hence, one in, you know. So, Jamie, I apologize. I, I, I confused you. We are absolutely covered by dual agency. Absolutely. And I suspect, I can't imagine how the deductible wouldn't be one deductible. Again, that's for a claim and any related claims to that claim. If a totally new claim out of the blue came up and were completely different lawsuit. You know, the likelihood of that happening, by the way, is pretty slim because before you settle, and most of you know who've dealt with me before, the buyer, the suing party signs a pretty darn good release that basically says you're done. You can't come back after us for anything. We don't care what. This so. is the last question. Oh, great. Then I have some comments and we'll wrap it up. 
when this goes into effect, when we meet with a seller to sign a listing agreement, how do we handle the commission to us on the listing side? And how do we include a compensation to the buyer agent to separate the difference? Will it be the same as it is now in the listing agreement where they're separated? Yeah, I suspect they will. There, there, there may be, uh, you know, there may be a way. They're going to have to structure that. There may be a division between what the listing agent uh, collects, and and be be sure you don't be confused. The ML, the uh, RLA on the top commission line is the total commission, and every once in a while, Lindsay, you know. Thank goodness for her because she catches this. Once in a while, you put two and a half on top and two and a half halfway down. And what you don't realize is what you just agreed is of the two and a half you're going to collect, you're going to give it all to the buyer side. So you have to have five on top and two and a half down below. So going forward, that's still going to happen. There's still going to be a overall commission uh, if there's a commission. There might also be a, not only a, an overall commission, but an agreement to pay a buyer concession. And the law will require that that concession not be limited to hiring an agent. But if the buyer is obligated to pay an agent, they can use that concession to pay the agent. Hope that answers your question. I think we'll get in more detail of that as we do these future classes. Well, if I can just make a quick comment, if you don't mind. Please. Well, first of all, excellent job on this. Lindsay, thank you for helping, Walt. This is incredible information. Um, a lot of stuff, obviously, people have been reading into and watching seminars and whatnot. I think this is very detailed. I do want to make a comment. Um, just like Walt said, we're going to do a lot of classes. Um, we're going to be doing a workshop actually in, in RB about um, KB Core. This is very imperative to actually have these presentations for buyers. And we'll, again, we'll do the trainings on that for you guys to kind of sit down with your buyers pre, um, pre showings, right? But I do want to make one huge comment that I want everybody to pay attention to, if you don't mind. And Walt, correct me if I'm wrong. I do think it's very imperative for you to call when before anything, before you accept an offer, before you know you talk to your clients about who you're working with, because who you're working with matters. Okay. Remember these other companies, cloud these cloud-based brokerages. I won't name them. You guys know who they are. If there's not a contact that Walt and I cannot call, all right, because we're not going to create a sim character in order to kind of chase them down. I've had an email address on other occasions where they gave us a general email address, we're still waiting for the response back. And in an occasion before Walt came into my life, um, I, I was dealing with a situation where just like this. And that person, uh, we couldn't get a hold of their broker, of course, couldn't hold of her manager. And when I finally got a hold of the manager, they are responsible for 6,000 people. They didn't obviously know this person from Emma or Eve. Make a long story long, that person got a restricted license and um, you know, on the other side because our client wanted to do something about it and we couldn't get a hold of the other broker. So here's my point. Before you or your client are considering an offer, make sure there's a contact number and information that we can contact them and get a hold of them. Because with all this, if you think the troubles um, in our careers and in, in our brokerages have been mounting up, you have no idea what's to come. There's going to be a lot more problems. There's going to be a lot more complaints. There's going to be a lot more recurring cause cases. There's going to be more issues um, with all this. I think this is a big mess. And again, we have our opinions we can vent with, right? Um, but I think this was a big money grab by attorneys, but uh, I'll keep my <laughs> I'll keep my comments to myself because I think this does not help the consumer at all. As a matter of fact, this hurts them more than anything else. I'm opposed to all of this. I think this is disgusting. Um, but again, I reserve the right to have my own opinion and I will keep continue to have that. But here's the, what a major, out of everything I'm talking about right now, it's so imperative that you work with the right brokerage and your client knows which brokerage to work with. Okay, so that's all I got. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mike. And exactly right on, right on that offer. You want to know who you're working with and how you reach them. Uh, and, and at the same time, maybe a brokerage number and the name of a manager wouldn't hurt. Wouldn't hurt. All right. So I want to close with this, folks. I'm going to make a couple of comments. And then I'm going to throw a slide up here in a minute. You don't need to write it down real quick because Lindsay's going to put it in the uh, chat and we'll email it out to you of a YouTube that I encourage every one of you to write. It almost, I've listened to it about four or five times. And I do it mostly to get pumped up. Uh, it brings almost a tear to my eye uh, how well she represents our position. What she feels, what Mike just said goes, you know, I, she could, she puts that 
exact context in the in the words that you know how this is really you know not a fortunate situation the point is we're going to recover you know you work hard right now yeah every one of you on this call you're hard working agents i i think that uh nobody works harder than a good real estate agent and we have a lot of good real estate agents you know uh but you're gonna have to work just a little harder to get through this that's a fact you provide a valuable service. Don't let anybody tell you that your only value is to open the door for a buyer. And you know that. Yeah, but don't let don't be beat up by that. You know, your clients are better off because of what you do. You help your clients get what they want. And that is the American dream, the home. And you do it as an entrepreneur. You take all the risk and you're only paid if you deliver results. What a concept. I know you're stressed. Mike knows you're stressed. The staff knows you're stressed. By the way, your spouses are stressed as well. This videotape makes a point of that. Uh, keep that in mind. You know, reach out to your spouse. Let them know this is going to be okay. We are going to survive. Uh, we are here to help you. Uh, some of the things working a little harder going forward, you're going to have to learn to navigate these rules. We'll help you with that. You're going to have to learn the forms. We're going to help you with that. You're going to have to learn to explain your value. We're going to help you with that. You're going to have to be able to do buyer presentations. That's going to be something new. We'll help you with that. You're going to have to get better at negotiating. You're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. We may not like it, but here's what's beautiful about real estate agents. Things happen to us every day. We don't like having our commission cut. We don't like interrupting Sunday dinner to negotiate a repair uh, fiasco, you know, I didn't like giving up my Christmas Eve to help my seller move, but we do it. Why? Because we're realtors and we serve our clients. Here is a YouTube video. Uh, the name of the broker is Lee Brown. She's a phenomenal lady. Uh, she's a North Carolina broker. She did, this is 38 minutes long. I, I debated, you know, putting it on the class, but I knew I couldn't because I knew the questions alone were, we've been here an hour and a half. Uh, so I couldn't keep you here another 38 minutes. So make a commitment. Lindsay, put this in the chat. We're going to email it to you. Make a commitment. It's worth it. You know, let me know. Let me know if you like it. I'd love to hear your comment. If you don't like it, let me know. But go to that link. Go to that YouTube. Give yourself 38 minutes uh, I get excited it. just thinking about it. So with that, folks, I want to thank you for being here and I hope I've answered your questions. I know you've got more. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to anybody, any one of us on the staff, uh, just like Brenda reached out to, uh, to a Stephanie, anything that any of us can help you with, will get you through this. Uh, you guys have a great rest of the day. Take Bye. Care. Bye everybody. Bye.